Welcome to the sermon podcast for First St. Charles United Methodist Church in downtown St. Charles, Missouri. We are so glad that you're here, and it's our prayer that you feel safe, welcome, and wanted in this space. If you're interested in finding out more about us or supporting our ministries, you can connect with us online at firststcharlesumc.org. Today's scripture is from the book of Revelation, chapter 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place, and he made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who testified to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. In the reading of God's written word, we hear. In the hearing of God's word, we act. In the acting on God's word, it becomes living in our lives. Thanks be to God. Once upon a time, there was a big farm near a vast field, and living there was a hen named Penny. She was great friends with everyone, and those who knew her gave her many names. Because she was a tiny hen, the other chickens in the yard would tease her for her size, calling her Chicken Little. While Penny surprisingly loved this name, her favorite thing was to be called Henny Penny, given to her by other fowls who lived nearby. The rhyme was perfect, it was sweet, and she liked it very much. One morning, as Henny Penny was plucking worms in the hen yard, an acorn dropped from a tree right onto her head. Kerplunk! She had no idea what had hit her, however, and so she started shouting to her foul friends, the sky is falling, the sky is falling, the sky is falling, the sky is falling. Thus begins the story of Chicken Little taught to many a child to show that what we think is a crisis really isn't. And, spoiler alert, the world was not ending. Instead, they all lived happily ever after. While today's scripture and the book it introduces might have more in common with a Stephen King novel. It's given to offer the greater perspective that promises that we too will live happily ever after. Hang on, we'll get there. Before we do, we need to acknowledge and not discount that crises do happen. This year, the Science and Security Board of the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists moved the hands of the doomsday clock forward, largely because of the mounting dangers of the war in Ukraine. The clock now stands at 90 seconds to midnight, the closest to global catastrophe it's ever been. Scientists worldwide keep telling us that whether we believe it or not, we're facing a crisis with our climate. The the planet is growing disturbingly warm and its life support systems are increasingly malfunctioning. We can all remember, can't we? The weekend when everything shut down with COVID, the whole world came to a sudden stop. And for my money, no crisis has had such far-reaching cultural impact since World War II. Last but not least, who among us doesn't feel the crises caused by differences in our cultural values and the politics that divide us all? All sides claiming apocalyptic authority. To all that could be added the crises that are individual and personal. The job loss, the 
cancer diagnosis, the divorce, the death of someone close, family feuding. Don't we all know that our fears find us in the emergency room, the school room, or at the political rally, or the halls of Congress? Given these immediate realities of our common life, where do our fears take us? Or do we take them? Any reaction must begin with a sober recognition that catastrophe is in the front room. As someone has rightly pointed out, the weather forecast includes the apocalypse. So, whether we like it or not, We've got to face these fears. As James Baldwin said in his characteristically direct and earthy ways, don't try to defend yourself against your fears. That is, think that you can live above them or outsmart them. Says Baldwin, to defend oneself against a fear is simply to ensure that one will one day be conquered by it. Fears must be faced. This is the reality faced by Scripture's final book that we call Revelation. By the way, it's singular, not plural. Please don't say the book of Revelations. It's singular, as if God knows we can only handle one apocalypse at a time. In fact, the word we translate as revelation is the first word in the text, and it's the Greek word apocalypsis, apocalypse, the apocalypse given to John. Is it a gift? Can apocalypse be a gift? The early church thought so and included it in the canon. They thought it was a gift because they knew that it's better to face our fears rather than not, and because they knew how God's story really ends. Somewhere along the way, a friend and colleague shared with me these three rules for reading Revelation. Number one, everything will turn out fine in the end. Two, if everything isn't fine, it isn't the end. Not yet. And three, in the meantime, no tapping your pencil and making everyone else nervous. The early church thought revelation a gift. Even though they were undergoing a crisis of persecution and had every reason to be nervous. Imagine this. A minority persecuted at the hands of the majority with the power of the state to back them. Can you imagine it? Christians like me who now still look and by every appearance are the majority can never read the Bible rightly if we don't get over ourselves and read it without the sanctified eyes of those with minority status. That's an important point, and so I'll repeat it. Christians can never read the Bible rightly if we don't get over ourselves and read it without the sanctified eyes of those with minority status. The first recipients of this gift of revelation were a minority persecuted by the majority with the power of the government. The minority Christians had every reason to be nervous. And so they wrote to each other in this unique genre of literature that we call apocalyptic. 
Apocalyptic literature developed approximately 200 B.C. and was in vogue until about 200 A.D. for 400 years. It had a good run. The problem we have in reading it now is that they wrote in coded language so that the wrong people would not be able to read it. They wrote using a numbers code. Once you learn to understand these codes, that Rome is the beast in Revelation that's sitting on seven hills, which the whole world is blasphemously worshiping as God. When I was a kid, shares one insightful soul, my mom and I had a code word to let her know that when I needed her to say no. For instance, if a kid at school asked me to come over and stay the night, but I really didn't want to, I'd call mama and ask her and then end it with, please mom. I never call my mama mom, just mama or moo moo. So she would know immediately to say that I was grounded or had too much homework or had some other malarkey. We also had a system the other way around. So if I called her to see how her date was going and she needed an out, she would call me baby doll and I'd tell her that I heard scary noises and was frightened and needed her to come home or something. Anyways, my point, she says, is that every family should have a system of codes to keep them safe. The early church family had their own particular codes, and they used it to write Revelation. Unfortunately, there's now a very popular reading of Revelation that completely ignores its context its coded language, and its type of literature, preferring instead to read Revelation as some kind of crystal ball predicting of the world's end. We don't have time or space here to unpack all the reasons that I'm all too glad to call it heresy, but what I'm talking about is the sensational stuff of dispensationalism or rapture theology and the left-behind fiction and movies of Hal Lindsey, Tim LaHaye, and Jerry Jenkins. It's made the whole lot of them a bloody fortune with their business of turning the Bible into a kind of fortune-telling. We don't have the time. But if we had all day, I'd walk you through how it misunderstands biblical prophecy, ignores the rules that govern apocalyptic literature, and distorts so many, many scriptures. If time permitted, I'd share with you how this is a very historically new interpretation, and that it proffers a dangerous picture of God who despairs of the world, gives it up to violence, then starts a new one. Would time permit, I'd say more about the way it pretends that the biblical story of Noah and the flood had never been told with God's promise that such cataclysm would never again come. And time permitting, I'd say more about its theologically heretical view that tells us we will escape this world. As one theologian says, how it boils down to little more than a perverse parody of John 3.16. God so loved the world that He sent it World War III. If we had more time, I'd tell you why Karen Armstrong is right when she says that such theology cultivates fantasies of revenge and fantasies of annihilation. Time weren't an issue. I talk about how this view issues forth in a kind of uncouth triumphalism that says, I win, you lose, nana, nana, nana. And 
last but not least, if we really had all the time in the world, I'd talk about how this view uses religion as an accelerant, a highly combustible agent added to stoke political and social fires, a theological justifier of deeper, more twisted passions. But you may not really want to know what I think about such bad theology. And since we need to move on, maybe you can just get the drift. And we do need to move on because the story does. And here's where this gift of revelation eventually takes us to a new place far from fear. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, See, the home of God is among mortals. God will dwell with them, and they will be God's peoples. And God himself will be with them and be their God. God will wipe every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more, for the first things have passed away. And the one who was seated on the throne said, See? I am making all things new. We can face our fears, but we do so with hope. With hope. It's a hope in God who makes all things new. It's a hope for God's transformation of the world, of what J.R.R. Tolkien called a catastrophe, an event which is cataclysmically good not bad not scary but good news gospel good news rightly read revelation shows us that we can experience crises without catastrophizing we can experience apocalyptic times and have every good reason to hope as john claypool put it with God, the worst things are never the last things. Lucy Maud Montgomery was a writer best known for her work, Anne of Green Gables. She once noted that there is a book of revelation in everyone's life as there is in the Bible. There is, that is, if we live as a testimony to hope, with our lives not ruled by fear, but by God who makes all things new, with God, the worst things are never the last things. This God is with us this moment and would reveal every bit as much to you.